Major support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. While they have been around and in use for many years institutionally, the assimilation of drones into the mainstream seems to be a recent phenomenon. And like many other tech-related products, there has been a voracious growth and adoption by consumers. Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business and public policy here in our region. I am Chris William, and this time an expert panel on drones, with their effect being way beyond the casual hobbyist. What are the consequences of the increasingly crowded skies, legislation, and practical uses of these microcrafts? Please stay with us. Gratefully acknowledging support by Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at Bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Tom Fernandez of Skyview Aerial Solutions, LLC, Susan Hofer of Cranfield Sumner and Hartsaw, Representative John Torbett of North Carolina, and James Stevens of the South Carolina Aeronautics Commission. Welcome to our program. Uh, it's already been an interesting dialogue, even before we started here. Tom, I want to start with you. You know, we made a comment at the beginning of this, uh, the opening of this, this particular program about that, that drones now have gone way beyond the casual hobbyist. Is that an, is that an overstatement? Not at all, Chris. Uh, in the low country, specifically in South Carolina, where Skyview Aerial Solutions operates, we use drones commercially five to seven times a day. And this is Monday through Friday. We're using them uh, for residential and commercial real estate. We're using them in large in construction and development. And while we are out there working, there are times where we run into other drones in the low country. So that's not an overstatement at all, Chris. Mm -hmm. what, what, you know, as a general aviist, uh, aviation, how, how do you, James, how do you characterize where we are with drones right now? Sure, Chris, thank you. Um, our airports, you know, we represent our airports at the South Carolina Aeronautics Commission. We help all of them communicate with the FAA. And many of the, the comments that we're hearing from our airport operators and users is they're afraid of, of the what if, what can happen, what's the potential to happen um, as they enter and exit the national airspace through our airport system. So there's definite concern there for safety. Mm -hmm. John, you uh, know a little bit about uh, laws and books in, in the bit. General Assembly, and how, how's North Carolina assimilated this, this idea of the rapidly growing drone? Well, we took advantage of it. We saw it coming a little, maybe a little bit before other people did, and uh, we were convinced that the FAA was moving at a very slow pace and, and wasn't getting things ready when, when obviously the machines were going to be hitting the, the uh, mm -hmm. skies. So we started four years ago and, and started uh, right. drafting our first UAS, or unmanned air systems laws, drones, and uh, have been kind of updating it and managing it over the last four years as new rules and regs came online from the federal. Was that a hard sell for your House colleagues or it, anyone, it, Senate? It, it was a unique sell because uh, after they understood that it was coming and that there, it was coming like a, like a tsunami, that it was going to be every kid's Christmas present for several Christmases in a row. Uh, then they started paying paying real close heed to it and, and getting uh, uh, virtually no issues getting those laws on the books and passage through both the House and the Senate. So speaking of laws, Susan, you practice this law. Is I this do. is this the Wild West days for drones right now? Uh, actually, I think it is. Uh, there's certainly a lot of precedent uh, that has come before it in the aviation realm for laws that uh, have been on the books mm -hmm. a long time. The FAA, of course. 
um, is charged with safety in the national airspace system, but the real challenge is trying to integrate drones into the national airspace system. And then there's questions that come up, what is the national airspace system and how far does it reach? How far does it go uh, to the ground? Or does it, is it above your house? Or where, where are you uh, having to observe the laws that the FAA already has on the books? And then the FAA, of course, has taken quite a while, as is usually the case with federal laws, in implementing, uh, as they did last summer, Part 107, which is directed to the commercial operation mm -hmm. of drones. Uh, but there's still a lot that is unknown, and, and especially in terms of privacy rights, and that is a big concern with citizens and how to get along and coexist with what has become, uh, as John said, a tsunami on this technology that's mm -hmm. so rapidly evolving. You, you know what, it, it's interesting the way you put this, and, and it, it poses this question to anyone who's sitting here right now, and that's this idea of, as you, Susan, you said, it's kind of redefining the DNA of what airspace really means. We've had large Correct, and yes. small aircraft, but now we've got something different, even down to, we were talking right before the cameras went on about micro drones. Yes. And that's the, a dragonfly, is that right? Correct. So how, Tom, does this redefine what it means to be in the air and under FAA control? Do you find Chris, that with I, yours? I, I would say yes and no. Um, yes, because we now are having what the FAA is defining as aircraft operating in airspace that traditionally has not been operated by manned aircraft. Mm -hmm. But also I say no because um, y you have these areas where all of a sudden because these aircraft or drones are operating where manned aircraft traditionally hasn't, now people want to extend their property rights into spaces that they traditionally were not. And now they're decrying privacy Mm -hmm. uh, invasion upon their backyard or upon their property mm -hmm. from an aircraft that can reach altitudes of a manned aircraft. So it's really difficult on, like Susan was saying, mm -hmm. where does that national airspace begin and end? So unmanned aircraft are, they're changing the definition. So you have to be debating this in the general aviation community. You had to do a debate this four years ago when first North Carolina adopted some laws around this. Mm -hmm. how, how do you all come down on this? Uh, First and foremost, uh, core responsibility of government is safety and security of its citizens. And so I said, before we do anything else as far as what you can and what you can't do, let's look how, it, how does it impact citizens at large. So we started looking at privacy rights. Mm -hmm. we, we scoured the laws, what's out there that could be adapted for UAVs, mm -hmm. some of your peeping Tom type laws. So we, we adapted those and we brought those in. So we have plenty of, of laws on the books that covered that and we just simply said, okay, if you are using an unmanned system or a drone uh, to do this law or break this law, then you're still breaking a law. Mm -hmm. You're just using a drone mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. so, so we addressed it that way. And then we started looking at some of the uh, property rights issues. And we, uh, I, in, in what way? That the, the, a great that word the, came the, out of that. Curtilage. So if you're a I'm child, of, a child of the, <laughs> if you're a child of the 60s, it's mm -hmm. an expanded aura. So yeah, curtilage is kind of the area that you exist in. And so that's the way uh, the law has defining. And as I was telling Susan mm -hmm. uh, at, at one of the events we were at talking about the, 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 the bones of the law, right. is that we've done the best we can to put something on the books, but it's no doubt that, that courts from years from now will make those final determinations on what is and what is not appropriate. Well, well James, but clearly airports and uh, public, private, small and large have had this idea of property rights and the extension of property rights above the airport. So is there some new DNA now that's being reworked with drones, as Susan had talked about it? In South Carolina, Chris, we have actually embraced the drone technology in our agency to utilize for obstruction evaluation. And this is something that all of our airports, North South Carolina, across the country face. Has the, has the State House adopted this? Is the State House looking at this? So right now, the State House themselves, they have not, we don't have any laws on the books in South Carolina. We do have three laws that are in uh, committee at this point in time, but they are basically to protect military institutions, correctional institutions, and to prohibit the use of law enforcement using um, firearms mm -hmm. on a drone. Mm -hmm. So that's where those members of our body, of our General Assembly, felt like they needed to put some efforts. We have not put any efforts into protecting uh, our airports yet. I'd like to do that, but we, my suggestion to our General Assembly members is, 
let's wait and let the FAA uh, establish their rules so that we can follow those rules and then tie on any state penalties if we're going to talk about that, state penalties to those federal regulations so that we're not reinventing mm -hmm. the wheel. For us, one of the things that we've done is utilize the drone technology to fly our, our approaches to our runways, which we've done for years with manned aircraft. We fly the approach, then we go and talk to a neighboring landowner about the trees that he has that are obstructing the approach surfaces to the runway. Mm -hmm. And it's been a difficult conversation over the years because they don't know what this in imaginary surface looks like coming down to the runway, their neighbor. So with the drone, we can put it, the post-processing data that we've collected, we can put it in a 3D model and actually show that landowner what his trees mm -hmm. look like in the airspace that supports the airport. So it's been a great tool and technology for us. But back on the legal side, as you've heard both of my, my counterparts here say that it's going to have to work through the legal system to get some judgments made yeah. and determinations made. So, so Susan, let me ask you this. Is, is the, the legality, is it the operational excellence, is, are, are the statutes going to end up coming out of legal action based on events or will, will the federal government, the FAA, the states, the general assemblies be proactive around, we're not going to let an event happen, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and regulate it now. Where, where do you see it going here? I think it's all of that because there's actually litigation going on out there brought by um, the FAA against people using drones. There's litigation going on by people that are homeowners against other folks that have tried to fly drones onto their property or harass mm -hmm. them or sur surveillance. And, uh, and so it's, it's coming from a lot, a lot of different um, directions to, uh, to just move this technology along. And the technology keeps evolving. And there's more and more use of it all the time. So that um, I think in the, there was a bill that was just introduced last week federally by a senator on privacy rights. Because as it is now, there's like a patchwork quilt of uh, legislation mm -hmm. that has been either implemented or on the books all around the United States. But to have privacy rights as a, as a federal matter. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't know how far that will go. But, but there's a lot of different um, avenues that are being pursued to try to get a handle on this. But there's also the technology is even involving, evolving further, like Uber is going to uh, and is developing unmanned vehicles for transporting people around and uh, micro drones mm -hmm. that we were talking about. So um, the legislation has to catch up with that. Are there, are there just, are there loopholes the size of trucks right now? I'm assuming there There's are. so much unknown. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about privacy rights is where do your privacy rights start? And that's things that are, that issue is going to have to be legislated because even though there are uh, laws on the books and there are, there's case law precedent for aircraft, as I was mentioning before, um, I see cases out there now, if you look, and, and the courts are having, going to have yeah. to make a decision as to how far someone can go. For instance, there's a recent case that the FAA, of course, takes the position that they own the whole airspace right mm -hmm. down to the ground. But there are other considerations of that, and there are people that are arguing that's not true, and especially for being able to use this technology close okay. to the ground. So, so, Tom and John, I want you to weigh in on this one. Uh, Tom, you seem like a, a respectful operator. You've certainly been doing it for a few years now. How, uh, when, you, when you see others that maybe not up to the standard that you do, where's the enforcement for a set of standards for a generally accepted operating a drone in this neighborhood or around this type of development? I mean, how, how is that enforced, I guess? I, I'm going to tell you from experience, there is no enforcement. Um, there was some enforcement in the past uh, against an operator named Raphael Perker, mm -hmm. but eventually that even settled for a very small amount. And so to the entire industry, that displayed a slap on the wrist from a federal mm -hmm. agency. And so you have operators, and I just saw a video last week, Chris, flying their units the entire span of the Ravenel Bridge, mm. 100 feet over traffic. That is reckless and that is dangerous. Will there be enforcement? I doubt it. I hope so, but I doubt it. But going back to what we were talking about privacy and where does the national airspace system start or end, 
if I can view someone's backyard over their privacy fence from my second floor bedroom, I am not invading their mm -hmm. privacy. But if I suddenly view their backyard with a drone at 200 feet, somehow I'm invading their privacy. I understand that reasonable legislation needs to be put in place, but the key word is reasonable mm -hmm. and common sense. You, you ever have a, a homeowner take a shot at one of your drones? Absolutely like not. A bird? Um, and people ask us that every day. Oh. Sometimes I would love to take a shot at our drones where they're not <laughs> doing what, I, what they want to. But th the general consensus for the past three years is when, when we are operating, they're excited, they, they smile, they take pictures, they mm -hmm. ask information, and we use as an opportunity to educate those people about what they're being used for and how they can mm -hmm. be safe. So John, how did you debate the issue of certainly legislation, but how did you debate the issue of, of, of enforcement when you were in the General Assembly in North Carolina doing this? Uh, we knew that it was gonna be uh, relegated to local law enforcement of, of all cities, counties, states, uh, agencies. So we have sent uh, our, our, our aviation uh, specialists out to train those different facets of, of local law enforcement. Uh, it, it, we're still doing that. Uh, and now we have added on emergency management personnel because of the, the, uh, mm -hmm. the floods from the hurricane out east. Uh, they were using drones. Actually, a life was saved because of, of someone using a drone. Yeah. Using it illegally, albeit, but still it saved a life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kudos to that individual. So we're trying to get everyone on board as to what, what is and what is not out there. Uh, mentioned the uh, looking over someone's fence. We, we heard all of those four years ago. And our, and our development on that was, you know, we can't keep people from doing that. You, you can't keep people from flying over your property, just like as if a Cessna 150 can fly over there today and take a picture of you in your backyard if they choose to. But what we, or how we addressed it was, if, if you disseminate a photograph or you take a, a, a piece of data and you disseminate that data out without that person's uh, permission, mm -hmm then that's when you have crossed that line, and that's when you have broken that law, so to speak. You know, there are uh, some, I think, some estimates, and you all know this number better than I, <coughs> 30,000 drones in service in both states, 25,000 registered drones, but more, probably more than 30,000. Uh, James, is this, is this an economic development machine, too? Are we looking at this not just from a punitive legal standpoint, but as, as and I probably ought to be asking you this, but uh, Tom, but James, is this also... So, are we seeing some economic development and jobs being created from this? In South Carolina, we haven't seen the actual creation of jobs yet. What we are seeing is at the University of South Carolina at the McNair Center in Columbia, they are actually looking at the development of the technology just to be in that space. They're aerospace engineering type training school and this fits well with their, with their mission. On the other hand, we do have people like Tom who have established businesses in the state and they definitely give economic benefit to the state by having a business there. Um, on the airports though, some of our airport operators are very leery about bringing somebody like Tom or a professional firm on the airport. Even though it's been defined federally as an aircraft, they still are leery about that. And that's gonna take an education, a, a communication from the state level, from the federal level, mm -hmm. down to airport managers, airport operators, to let them know, hey, this is, this is just like that Cessna 150 or that Citation jet that comes and goes from this airport. What, what are the pilots saying? The pilots, um, the pilots are saying that they're afraid of it because there's a lack of communication. Uh, you mean they can't speak to the tower or the, the aircraft? The aircraft. So most of our airports in our state are in what's called Class G airspace. It's uncontrolled airspace. Airports, most of our airports live in that airspace and air, aircraft come and go from those airports all day long. They do so based on the communication on, on frequencies at those airports. A drone operator does not, is not required to communicate mm -hmm. on that frequency. So if they have come into that space within that five miles and they are not communicating, that's where the fear comes in with the pilots that are coming and going from those airports. So Tom, let's go back to this idea of economic development. So you have clearly done a, a role in creating jobs. Absolutely. I mean, you're smiling, you love your job, <laughs> but if you, not but you you keep doing this and you become really good at it and you actually would it would seem like 
take some jobs or eliminate some jobs because you could do it more efficiently. Somebody crawling around a plant looking for IR or infrared, you know, heat escaping, and you could do that from the air instead of having someone down on the ground doing that. Correct, and, and here's what's interesting, and let me revise James's numbers. Um, I know of four jobs that have been created, <laughs> um, and I happen to know those people personally. <laughs> um, as far as drones creating an economic uh, incentive for an economy, whether it's in South Carolina, North Carolina, or anywhere else in the United States. Um, when we use our drones, our services often are more expensive than the traditional services offered by ma manned aircraft. But we are still being hired. And the reason being is because our drones are providing precision data that a manned aircraft cannot. And so while it may cause a deficiency in other traditional fields, I see it as an opportunity to retrain an industry to move with that evolution of technology. So what, uh, do you feel like, as, as Susan had described some of the legal aspects and some of the punitive aspects from the legal uh, standpoint, do you feel like you have to have, do you have coverage in case you are sued by a homeowner because you flew too close to the corner of their property? <clears throat> so required by law, no. Professionally for business, absolutely. Because if these drones are not perfect, just as a computer has its viruses or even a natural crash, we fly so much, we have seen the problems that these units can have. Thankfully, they have not caused any damage, but they certainly can cause injury to person or property. And as far as insurance carriers covering that, I'm not sure that we've seen a claim on an insurance provider for any type of damage caused by a drone. John, John you not, I want to give you a chance to talk about that, but John, you nod like this is not the first time you talked about it. Yeah, it, it's, it's folks like Tom we don't worry about too much. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he's in the business. He wants to continue being in the business. He wants to be profitable and hire more people on, put food on a family table. So it's, we're not really worried about what Tom's doing. What we're worrying about is, is the, this more non-conventional operation, commercial operations and uh, hobbyists, if mm -hmm. you would, that, that are out there uh, without that business model, without that profitability, without that, those other things that they're trying to do. They're just out there flying it to have fun, enjoyment, relax. It's just, some people, it's like kids are gaming. Now they're out there flying drones. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the ones that we're, we're, we're trying to kind of shift our focus on to the point of bringing them into the awareness of what they really should be doing and what they really shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some bad things can happen just from not knowing that I shouldn't be doing that. And right. probably unintentional is what you're probably saying. Probably unintentional, absolutely. Now, there are some of those things we're having to address, uh, like flying uh, guns or, or, or cell phones into prisons, those types of things. Mm -hmm. Those are deliberate actions. Those are bad things. But we're not, like I say, we're not worried about the commercials because yeah. the commercials, they're professionals out there. They know what's going on. Their, their system that they fly is probably one that is on the higher end of the, of the, of the money scale mm -hmm. as far as drones cost. So it, it's the ones that are the ones that are out there doing it every day that just don't follow perhaps uh, what the FAA is requiring them to do and what the states are requiring them to do. So, so Susan, operators like Amazon that have made a big splash about what they want to do with drones, right. have they redefined? Have they defined what an appropriate way to do it and how to do it uh, at least institutionally or formally? Uh, well, they're going to—they're running up against some challenges in the United States. Uh, Is that why they beta test in the UK? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on a, out in the country. Yeah. Uh, Tell them why they do that. Yeah, we're not the UK, doing that. Don't look over there. <laughs> why they? Because the U, UK doesn't have the FAA. I mean, we'll yeah. just make that clear. Okay. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, but there are, um, as it exists right now, as the laws exist right now, there certainly are a lot of impediments not only federally but state-wise because as I mentioned before it's a patchwork quilt as to what uh, legislation mm -hmm. is in place currently across the states and so to operate uh, a commercial enterprise like that to deliver packages it's a great idea but we're just not there yet and there's going to have to be further legislation there are there's the ability to obtain waivers from some of the regulations but not all the regulations and so for amazon to deliver they can't overcome some of the regulations that currently exist it's going to be very difficult for them to do that as a practical matter. For instance, commercially, you can't fly mm -hmm. over people. So that could be a real impediment. Um, you can't fly beyond uh, line of sight, beyond you being able to see the drone. 
Uh, you can't fly multiple drones. Now, some of these things can be waived, but at this point in time, I think it's going to be uh, difficult to implement that. I mean, there are even, um, uh, there's research being done, the FAA is fostering that for some kind of air traffic control, if you will, of drones. Because as this develops, there's going to be more and more drones in the air. They're looking at act you know, actual mm -hmm. routes, like in the New York area, yeah. to have corridors yeah. where drones can fly. So it, it's moving in that direction, but as it currently exists, I think there's, there's okay. some. Okay, we'll have to have part two because that's gonna take us down right. another road. There's a Chinese company that's made a super drone that'll carry people and they've tested mm -hmm. it, but right, right. completely mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for being on the program to all of you. Uh, James, good to see you. Susan, thank you for thank so you. much. Thank Tom, you. good luck down there. And as well as you, Representative, thank you for leading the way on this. Uh, until next week, I'm Chris William, good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Novant Health, Sunoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.